while a life free from discrimination is enshrined in the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms and in the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, we know that this is far from being the reality for Black children and their families. Systemic racism prevents Black children from achieving their full potential. And we want to support community efforts that are working to do something about this. So today our special event is bringing together young people and community educators to learn about the history of anti-Black racism in Canada, how to advocate for yourself as a Black youth during COVID-19 and how a youth can stand in solidarity with, with Black youth. In addition, we're also gonna have the opportunity to ask federal leaders about what they're doing to address anti-Black racism in Canada. Joining us today will form a special panel of members of parliament, including Greg Fergus, uh, Samira Zuberi, Kenny Chu, Matthew Green, and Jenica Atwin. We're also gonna be joined by Senator Wanda Thomas-Bernard, who many of you have met before. Uh, we're also gonna have some incredible speakers and some very special guests who will be introduced uh, just in a, a few moments. Uh, who are going to give some special presentations, including Kids Help Phone, to help us understand the supports that are available for youth experiencing anti-Black racism. Today's event, we're going to be hosted by Shanice and Christopher, who are two young people who are fierce advocates for young people in their home province of Ontario. Both Shanice and Christopher have been actively engaged in advocacy around Black, the rights of Black youth and children in care. So please join me in welcoming Shanice and Christopher as your special host today. Thank you, everybody. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Shanice McCannis, and I'll be the host today alongside my colleague, Christopher Caldo. I'll tell you more about me later, because right now I would like to introduce to you our keynote speaker, Wes Hall, the executive chairman and founder of the Black North Initiative. Wes Hall is an established innovator, entrepreneur, and philanthropist. As, ex as executive chairman and founder of Kingsdale Advisor, he has been named one of Canada's most powerful business people. In 2009, West Hall was recognized for the Ernest and Young, er and, sorry, the Ernest and Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award for Ontario, Canada. West is also known for his generosity, leveraging his business to uh, his business success to benefit others with a number of different impactful charitable initiatives. He's the founder and chairman of the Canadian Council of Business Leaders Against Anti-Black Racism, Systemic Racism, and the Black, North, uh, the Black North Initiative, committed to the removal of anti-Black systemic barriers negatively affecting the lives of Black Canadians. He's also a director of Sick Kids Foundation and a board member of Pathways to Education and Toronto International Film Festival. West Hall has also changed the lives of thousands of children in the Caribbean, donating both his time and money. In 2015, West was the recipient of the Vice Chancellor Award, and in 2017, he received an honorary doctorate from uh, both from the University of West Indies. So without further ado, please welcome West Hall. Uh, I decided to do something very differently in terms of the presentation today and more kind of speak to you uh, from, from the heart as opposed to having a prepared presentation. Uh, and I'm going to uh, start with like where I am now, where I came from, and back to where I'm at now. And, um, and, and, and it may start, the start may look like I'm, uh, I'm bragging a little bit and uh, Shanice uh, read my bio and uh, the bio sound like I'm this impressive guy, but uh, uh, you know, there's a, there's a method for that, that madness because in order for you to get people's attention, uh, people have to realize that you have accomplished something to deserve their attention. So I'm gonna tell you why I'm here today. And if I didn't accomplish what I had today, uh, you probably wouldn't know who West Hall is and you wouldn't even care. So I'm gonna sh uh, try to share my screen. I'm not very technical. And, uh, and, and, and start off by a little bit about with some images in terms of uh, you know, who this, uh, this dude that, that's talking to you is and kind of where, where he, how he got started, okay? So this is the image uh, of the report on business. Uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to actually be the first, uh, and I hate using that term, the first, um, but uh, the first black man to or black person to actually get the cover of the report on business magazine. And they still have not had another black person on the cover of that magazine since. Uh, the whole objective is to really change that conversation 
as you can see, the uh, the title there it says the fixer, and uh, and it talks a little bit about my job in corporate Canada, what I do on Bay Street, and the fact that uh, I you know run this very influential firm that I built from the ground up, and it also talks about uh, where I started uh, on Bay Street. It says. Uh, on the front there, how a one-time mailroom clerk became one of uh, Bay Street's most influential power brokers. So that's the, that's a little bit of start. You know, how do a guy like this here, you know, I'm the chubby guy in the middle, you know, get to hang out with a guy like Masai Jerry and, and telling jokes to him and the prime minister? How did that, uh, how did that happen? Um, you know, and if you see a guy like this, uh, uh, me driving a car like this, this is uh, one of my, my, uh, favorite toys that I that I drive in the summertime is the uh, it's a McLaren 650s, and if you see a guy looking like me driving that car, what would you think? Would you say he's a uh, he's a schmuck? Uh, would you say that uh, you know? Would you use all kinds of adjectives in a negative way to describe him? Would you say that it's unachievable? I would never be able to be that person. I never be able to drive a car like that. What would you say, especially if the man is a black man? Would you say he's a drug dealer? You know, what would you think about the man that, again, drives a vehicle like that down the street? Well, this is that man. That's how he got started. This is me. This is me with my grandmother. You would see that my grandmother, there's an old, older lady. Uh, my grandmother took me in when she was uh, 60 years old. And uh, she actually, uh, my mom uh, left myself, my younger brother, my older sister, in a house by ourselves. I was about 18 months old. And, uh, and she left us there for days and the neighbor realized that we're by ourselves. And uh, she went to the uh, plantation. My mom, my grandmother worked at the banana plantation and the coconut plantation. And she went to the plantation to get my grandmother to say, your grandkids are by themselves. And she came at 60 years old and got me. And that's how I started to live with her. You know, I've always had style, you know, and, uh, you know, ever since I was a kid, I had that style. So the style kind of continued uh, up until this day, but that's how it got started. But this is the house that I was raised in, in Jamaica, uh, with my grandmother, 14 brothers and sisters. And uh, this picture was taken when I was 19 years old. That's me standing with my grandmother. And I remember the conversation like it was yesterday. And I said to her, uh, we call her mama. I said, mama, one day I'm gonna get you out of this place and uh, I'm gonna make your life better. And uh, I never really had the opportunity to get mama out of that house. She died in that house. She died in poverty. And um, and, and that's it, she died in that house. I keep that uh, picture on my desk, in my office. And it's the first thing that I look at when I come to work on Bay Street because I thought I didn't work hard enough to get her out of that house and that's why she died there. And that picture reminds me that I should never forget where I came from. I never forget that the, that's the house that I was raised in and that what I accomplished was deemed to be impossible, but I did it. And it's not impossible. Uh, we just need the opportunity and we need people to believe in us. And if we get people to believe in us, we can do the impossible. So I keep that picture to remind me that this was, is where you came from. That fancy car that you drive is not you. The house that you live in is not you. The office that you occupy in Bay Street is not you. The fancy suits that you wear is not you. This is you. So don't forget that. And don't let anything that you accomplish in this life get to your head and forget where you came from. That's why I kept that picture. And um, it's because of that picture why I made it uh, on the cover of the Globe and Mail report on business. Why? They were doing an article that, uh, that deals with Bay Streets and some of the power brokers on Bay Streets, Bay Street. And um, 
the reporter were, uh, kept on hearing from people that you need to talk to this guy, Wes Hall. And, uh, and he kept on, he wasn't talking, the article wasn't about me, it was just about Bay Street and all the influential people on Bay Street and the people that actually makes a difference on Bay Street. And he would, you know, uh, interview these lawyers and bankers and all these people. And I go, have you talked to Wes? Have you talked to Wes? And he said, well, maybe I should talk to this guy, Wes. And, uh, and he came into my office and I was talking to him later on and he told me what, uh, what happened. He said, when I walked into your office, I was absolutely shocked that you're a black. I didn't know that a black person could accomplish this. I, couldn't, I didn't know that a black person could achieve this. And then he saw this picture on my desk and he asked me, what's that picture for? And I said, that's my grandmother and me and that's where I grew up in Jamaica. And as a result of that, he said, this story has to be about you and what you've accomplished and how difficult the road must have been to get to where you are today. And that's because of this picture. And that's why I never forget it because I keep it so close to me because it keeps me grounded. I'll stop sharing the screen and stop depressing you guys. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll tell you in terms of that start, you know, I, um, I came to Canada, September 27, 1985 was a Friday. I started school on Monday. When I joined, when I went to school, Lester B. Pearson in Malvern, um, I was enrolled in school and I realized that um, this, uh, you know, nobody in, the, in my class was speaking English. And then, because as you know, when you go to high school, they put you in front of a guidance council and the guidance council will pick your, pro your, your courses for you. And that's what they did. Well, because I had a, a strong Jamaican accent, keep in mind, Jamaica is an English speaking country. Because of the fact that I had a strong Jamaican accent, they actually put me in the ESL program in high school, even though it's coming from an English speaking country. So I went back to my dad and I said to my dad, you know, hey, you know, after a week in the program, I said, it's kind of unusual that all the kids in my class are learning English. And he goes, what, there's a problem. So he went into school and then they took me out of the ESL program and they put me in the, another program, which is called Applied. For those who are in high school, you know the applied program is the one that's really easy. And uh, as a result of getting into the applied program, you don't really, miss, you can't, you don't qualify to, for university. I went back to my dad after and I'm going, dad, the program, the math, English, everything is so easy. It's like, it's much easier than Jamaica over here. And he felt something was wrong. So he went back in school again and uh, they took me out of that and put me into the advanced studies. You would know that term as, a, as streaming. That's what that was. I was streamed. And what they did in schools where they put these black kids into the easier program because they want them to graduate and it makes it easy for them. Unfortunately, what happens with streaming is that you end up being in a position whereby uh, you disqualify from going to university. And once you disqualify from going to university, you're disqualified from higher paying jobs. So essentially, you're disqualified from being on Bay Street. You're disqualified from being a school teacher. You're disqualified from being a doctor. You're disqualified if you become a police officer. You're disqualified from being promoted to a sergeant or further up. You're just disqualified all the way. And uh, so when I came to, to this country, that was my first experience. But here's the beauty about coming to Canada. I've never seen anything like it. I've never been on an airplane before. I've never left my village that I was raised uh, before. I came, I came out of uh, this, this neighborhood. My mom came and got me when she was 11, uh, when I was 11 rather, and she brought me into uh, to live with her. And then at 13 years old, my mom packed my bags and threw me out and said, you're on your own. At 13 to 16, I lived on my own. I fend for myself. I worked uh, in the evenings. I sell stuff to make a living. And at 16, my dad said, I remember this kid that I have in Jamaica. I'm going to bring him to Canada with me. And that's when I came here, September 27, 1985, Friday. And it changed my life because I've seen things that I've never really exposed myself to before. I never seen it before. The village I was from, I didn't have electricity. We didn't have a television. We didn't have anything like those. And here I am. I came, started to be educated, went to school. But I also recognize the fact that I have a responsibility to my family. 
And, uh, you know, I live, with, but I live with my dad, I was 16. And as you, you know, at 16 years old, what happened when you're 16? You know everything. You're the smartest person on the planet. I was one of those 16 year olds. I came here and I was not respectful to my dad. I didn't really want to be the guy who had to come home at a certain time. I want to hang out with my buddies after school and stuff like that. My dad is not that guy. My dad was, when school is done, you got to come home because I don't want you to go to jail. I don't want you to get into trouble. You live in Malvern. You're going to go to university when you graduate high school and you're going to become somebody. Okay, that's what my dad was. And that was hard for me. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't hack it. At 18, I packed my bag and I left. And my dad didn't even know that I was leaving. I just left in the middle of the night. And I was on my own. I finished high school on my own. Later on, I realized that my dad was a superstar and he knew what he was doing. Uh, we reconciled later because uh, I felt I was a man, but I didn't know what I was in for. At 19 years old, just after that picture that you saw with my, me and my grandmother, uh, I got married that, uh, I, I, you know, and I left my, uh, uh, I sent for my mother, my brothers, two brothers and sister to come live with me here in Canada. And I was married for a month when they came to live with me. Two sisters, two brothers. My brothers were younger than me, a couple of years younger. One, one was 16 when same age I came to Canada. My sister, the other sister was 15. My older sister was 24. And, um, and here they are living with me. And my job was in the mail room of a law firm, the bottom of the company where you can start. That was my job. And I was supporting seven people, my five, my mom and uh, four siblings, my wife and myself. But we juggled. Well, my brothers felt that this place is just, I can't hack it here. It's too hard. Like you're going to the mail room and all that kind of stuff. I, I'm not into that. My younger brother, 16 years old, same age that I was at when I came here, he started to get into trouble, start to sell drugs, start to hang out with people that were in the wrong side of the neighborhood. And um, eventually the authorities had enough and he was deported to Jamaica. And he's still in Jamaica, really having a hard time today still as a result. He got the great opportunity of his lifetime that I had and he looked at it very different than I did. My other brother, who was older than him, felt the same way, but he was like a factory worker. He was working with his, hand, with his hands because he wasn't educated. My dad was a factory worker when he, came, when he came to Canada, and he retired a factory worker. But he sent five kids through university as a result of that job. Nothing wrong with working with your hands and hard work. But my brother didn't want to do that. So he said to me one day, Wes, I'm leaving Canada. I'm going to the States. That's the land of opportunities. I'm going there. And um, I was at work one day and I got a phone call from someone from, the, from Buffalo. And a phone call was from the coroner's office in Buffalo. And they indicated that um, we found a body and uh, in the, on the person's, uh, uh, in their possession is your name and it indicated that you were a relative. And I went to Buffalo to identify the body and it was my brother. Uh, he was found in a dumpster. Uh, his hands were tied behind his back. There was a bag over his head and he was beaten to death. Uh, and, uh, and I had to bury him. So um, that's the choices we have as young people, right? We have a choice. It's like a fork in the road. You can go right or left. Right kind of looks, uh, you know, really appealing in the short term. Left, it's hard work, heavy lifting. But the left direction, you know, there's an expression in the Bible. There's, you know, there's two roads. Broad and spacious is the one leading off into destruction. Cramped and narrow is the one leading off into everlasting life. Most people take a large road because it's wide. It's like a massive highway. Nobody wants to be cramped. So my encouragement to you is to take the cramp road, work hard, and uh, you'll get there. So I started on Bay Street in the mailroom, and I got here because I've met white folks that looked at me and saw something in me that I didn't see in myself, and they gave me opportunities to show them 
that they were right. And I took advantage of that opportunity to show them that they were right. I've always go through life with the mantra that uh, there is always somebody watching you. You don't know who they are. You don't know they're watching you, but there's always somebody watching you and they can either help you or hinder you. But the, what action they take, whether they help you or hinder you, is all based on your action. Based on how they perceive you as an individual will determine whether or not they're going to go, I'm going to help that kid. I'm going to help that kid. So I was one of those persons where I had something in between here, but I never had the opportunity until I met this one man, Glenn O'Farrell. He was a white man, like I said, he was 34 years old. I was in my early 20s and he hired me. And what attracted him to me was my lived experience. I didn't know I was supposed to hide the fact that I grew up with, I had 14 brothers and sisters. I have all these trauma in my life. I didn't know that at the time. So when he was interviewing me and he asked me about my life, I told him about my life. Nowadays, would you tell an interviewer that you had a brother that was murdered and you have a brother that was deported and that you have 14 brothers and sisters and you live in a tin shack? Would you? No. We're told to hide those things about ourselves, but we shouldn't because it makes us who we are. It makes us unique and authentic. And so we, we're trying to change corporate Canada to say, look at people's lived experiences before you hire them, right? Because those people are the ones that's gonna change the world because they have a conscience and they, it makes them think and behave differently. So I got those opportunities and I kept on taking advantage of them when I get them. I just kept on doing it. And I kept on climbing and somebody say to me, Wes, when are you gonna stop? When are you gonna stop? And I say to them, I'm gonna stop when someone tap me on the shoulder and said, you've gone far enough. Because I didn't expect that I would get this far. So who knows how far I can go, right? And so you just keep on going. So there's always going to be people that you've met along the way who look at you and say, you can't do what you set out to do. Those goals that you have for yourself, you cannot achieve them. And I say to you this, that they're putting their own limitations on you. And don't ever let somebody else put their own limitation on you and what you can accomplish. So I am pretty fortunate to be in a position where I am today. But why Black North? You know what? You know, I've been successful. I've built, I have five kids that are wonderful kids. I've been married for almost 30 years to the same woman. Um, and why is that important? Why did I say that? I was married for 30 years to the same woman. The perception of Black men is that we can't be monogamous. But I've seen the scars of, uh, of, of, of not being monogamous growing up with my grandmother and the fact that she was by herself and she had to feed all these kids, grandkids of hers, and she had to work multiple jobs. And she goes to bed late at night hungry and she get up really early at 4 a.m. in the morning to start all over again. I remember asking, where's my dad? Where's my mom? And had no answers. I did not want to repeat that cycle. I wanted to make sure that I break that cycle and end it. And that's what we need to think about as young black people. Don't let the environment in which you were raised define who you are. Look at it and go, I am not gonna let somebody else go through this environment as a result of my action. I'm gonna break the cycle. So when I look at what happened with George Floyd and I look at all the young people, people your age that were in the streets marching and say, this is unacceptable. And it wasn't just black people, it was people of all colors that were out there in the streets and they were young and they were defying directions from our government to say, stay in your homes because of COVID. They go, no, we prefer to die of COVID than to watch this continue. Could you imagine the power that you have in your hands and you never, you haven't been using them? And now you started to use it but don't stop using it. So when I saw what happened to George Floyd, I said, I have to do something 
I have to follow the, uh, the, the, the lead of those young people. And I have to help them to make the changes that we need to have in corporate Canada. So I am going to talk to all the people that I've done business with, all the influence that I've garnered over the years, and I'm gonna encourage those people to do something to deal with anti-Black systemic racism. We're gonna form this group called Canadian Council of Business Leaders Against Anti-Black Systemic Racism. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna sign a pledge and we're gonna say within our own organization, we're gonna see whether or not there are systemic barriers that exist that prevent black people from advancing in our company. And we're gonna start at the very top of the company. We're gonna start at the board. And we're gonna look around the boardroom and if there are no black people at the board, we're gonna ask as the CEO of the business, why aren't there any black people on my board? And I'm gonna look in the executive suite and if I look around the table and there are no black people, I'm gonna ask the same question. Why aren't there black people around the executive table? And I'm gonna ask the same question about indigenous people as well. And I'm gonna look in the pipeline of my business. And if there are no blacks and indigenous there, is there a reason for it? Black people graduate university every day. Harvard, Yale, Queens, you know, McMaster, McGill, every day with white folks and people of color. We look at corporate Canada at the top, one culture represented, one culture. We have a cultural mosaic in this country. It's beautiful for being a cultural mosaic, but the cultural mosaic stops in neighborhoods and it stops at the top of corporate Canada. But yet we're graduating people. So there's systemic reason why Two people can graduate from university at the same time with the exact same degree, black and white. One person make it to the top of the company and the other person, as soon as they get in, they flush out. Why is that? They're not all of a sudden become unambitious when they get into the workforce. There's systemic reasons for it. So let's start with our company. And while we're fixing that, recognize the fact that, and, and by the way, the stats are, uh, if I graduate with a white person with the exact same degree in this country, I'm going to get 20% less in compensation for the exact same degree, doing the exact same job, 20% less in compensation. In addition to that, that 20% less means $1.5 billion out of the black economy as a result of that disparity, right? So let's look at those things. And while we're fixing them, don't just wait to say, I'm going to fix them in my organization first. Let's look at society. Recognize the fact that our black employees must now drive home and are they unnecessarily harassed because of the vehicle that they drive when they're driving home. In the city of Toronto, 70% of the police death by civilians are of black people getting killed. 54% of use of pepper sprints of black people. The stats are incredible in terms of those things. When they access, my employees access the healthcare system, are they treated differently? By the way, uh, Shanice, when I'm, you know, just wave like this if I'm going too long, right? Just, you know, it's, uh, I'm going too long, okay, I'm gonna wrap up, okay? Uh, you know, so when we look at all those, uh, uh, all those things, uh, we go, we have to do something to change the conversation. And we have to, as business leaders, recognize the fact that it's a part of our responsibility to change the conversation and not say it's up to government to do it. We have to work collectively just like we're doing with COVID-19. So that's really how the Black North Initiative uh, got started. And we have 375 companies, some of the largest companies in the country that actually signed the pledge that we're gonna do these things. And so far we're seeing massive changes in society. So when you guys get to the point where you now go, those of you who are getting into the workforce, get into the workforce, that hopefully there are no barriers there preventing you from moving ahead and getting promoted up in the organization. But what I'm saying to you is, as a part in words is, continue to advocate, continue to push hard. We have a tendency when the pressure is off as a society to just go back to normal. There is no normal. And we know we're hearing that more and more with COVID-19 that there is no normal. There's a new normal. Make your, uh, the opportunity to advocate and push the envelope be the new normal so that we don't go back to the ways whereby it's just unfair. So, and lastly, we're not asking for equality as black people. And it may, uh, you know, sound strange hearing that, 
we're asking for fairness. Fairness so that we can have an opportunity to become equal once we get that fairness. So that's it. Uh, uh, thank you very much for, for your time. I'm sorry to be going on and taking up so much of your time. Now listen, thank you so much, Wes Hall. I, just, I first of all want to say thank you because you're being a representation for us. Children like our viewers, youth like me, need to be able to see representation like you. Uh, that help us realize what may seem impossible is actually within our reach. And what you're doing is paving a way for us. So thank you. From the bottom of my heart, thank you. We'll talk. I hope you stay to the end to hear some powerful messages, you know? Okay. Um, but I'm yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Buzz Hall. Um, and so uh, I want us to be able to move into our breakout rooms now. Uh, so we're a little bit behind schedule, which is fine. And um, I guess so what we're going to do is I want you guys to really be able to meet me and Christopher Cottle. So um, we'll probably do like a one minute quick introduction about ourselves. I'm going to be the host alongside with my colleague, Christopher. I'm a little bit about me. I am a passionate child youth advocate. Um, I work uh, on, on the province and I also have my own organization. It's called Project Outsiders and it's a social organization that's trying to bridge the gap between youth and the foster care system with decision makers. I'm also on the board for York Region and um, I'm on a, on a few committees as well. And so I'm really trying to pave a way for not only just youth in care, but especially black youth in care. Um, and then also Christopher, if you wanna quickly introduce yourself as well before we head out into our break group, like breakout sessions, that'll be fantastic. Yeah, so uh, nice to meet everyone. My name is Christopher Cottle. Uh, so I'm just a black youth uh, advocate for um, youth in uh, foster care and infant care. Um, I work every single day to try to um, push messages from, from youth in care uh, um, uh, via um, different communication methods. So right now I, I do podcast editing and producing uh, for several different people, including, uh, well, including Shanice upcoming. Um, so yeah, I just, um, I hope that everyone's uh, ready and enjoying this, uh, what Wes Hall had to say. Uh, a lot of the messages that he's like promoted are like things that like uh, me and Shanice have been working on promoting like our, our whole lives. So I'm just really happy to be a part of this event and like helping push just these messages and teaching not only just black youth, but everyone uh, about advocacy. So, yeah. All right. So we are going to head out to our breakout sessions, but I want to since these topics are heavy I just, uh, as we're kind of getting ready to move into our breakout sessions, um, there are uh, peer support workers in each one of them. And so we'll talk more about it once you guys uh, enter your breakout rooms. All right, see you guys there. Yeah, uh, welcome back to everyone. Uh, and for those that uh, were uh, doing question and answer period, if, um, if you're able to mute your mic, uh, just uh, please do so uh, while we're doing this next session. Uh, and then a quick reminder for those uh, who are French listeners, um, if you want to be able to listen to this in French, um, you're able to click uh, below, um, below right beside the, uh, the leave uh, room button, there should be a, uh, an interpretation section. And in that section, there should be French. And then when you click that French section, it should change to the French audio um, that we have. Uh, and for those that are also um, that haven't um, been informed yet, we do have uh, peer support individuals. Um, Mars, Antoinette, and Lashan um, are all going to be available during the panel. So if you'd like to speak to them, uh, just please uh, private message them, um, and then they'll be able to create a, a breakout session with you or a chat room to be able to then further talk. Um, <clears throat> cool. Uh, so we have an incredible group of parliamentarians with us today that'll be answering questions about anti-Black racism in Canada. Um, our esteemed panel includes uh, Greg Fergus, uh, who is a liberal member of parliament, uh, who's worked in the private, public, and not-for-profit and academic sector for over 25 years. Yeah, oh, okay. uh, he said that he's really excited in the chat. Um, he has been an advocate for social housing and seniors, uh, and has served as a mentor on the board of directors for the residents 
um, of semi-retired and retired seniors and a member of the local uh, parish council. Previously, he was vice president uh, of a neighborhood association and was involved with school uh, committees, sports teams, uh, organizations promoting regional interests. Uh, our other panelist is Samir Zuberi, um, and she, oh, sorry, um, they uh, are also a liberal member of parliament um, who's currently um, a member of the standing committee of the justice and human uh, rights and the uh, standing joint regulations review committee. Um, uh, from from an early age, uh, he, uh, they they've been building bridges between communities and promoting dialogue and mutual understanding. Uh, this has led him to over the past eighteen years to work and promote diversity, inclusion, human rights, mutual respect between communities, and play a leading role in protecting. Uh, yeah, sorry, sorry, my my apologies. Yeah, Samir's pronouns are he him. Um, um, promoting, sorry, uh, yeah, pr um, mutual respect between community communities and play a leading role in uh, protecting the rights of Canadians, minorities guaranteed in the charter. Our other member of parliament uh, is uh, Shadow Minister uh, Kenny Chu, um, a former Richmond School trustee and uh, recent co-host of uh, News Talk on uh, Child Fair Morning Radio. Shadow Minister Chu moved to Canada in 1982 and has worked to raise his family um, and being served uh, in the community for over 25 years. Uh, during uh, his term as school trustee, he has provided leadership and in including uh, and in increasing the district schools uh, building funding, uh, keeping the districts ready for Richmond's ever growing community. And um, previously on the board of uh, the minute, uh, Mennonite, Mennonite uh, Housing Association. Um, his help, uh, and he's helped provide housing for low-income families, assisted living for senior, seniors as a member of the Philippine uh, Canadian Trade Council. He's encouraged entrepreneurship in uh, newly uh, transferring migrants. Um, our our other member is Matthew Green, a member of parliament for, with the NDP party. Um, he's an um, accomplished community organizer and has served for over a decade to advocate with barrier-free access to healthy um, living on First Nations territories within inner cities, Hamil uh, Hamilton, Hamiltonians, that's how you pronounce it. Uh, and has passed the Blue Dot motion, making Hamilton the first city uh, in Ontario to adopt the Environmental um, Bill of Rights. And I also really appreciate that name. Uh, it is a very uh, beautiful name. Um, and uh, this advocacy opposing, um, is an advocacy opposing police carding, uh, racial profiling with direct impact on uh, provincial policies resulting in more stringent uh, regulations with, um, with how local police interact with their communities. Um, and uh, we are also um, gathered with uh, Janice Atlin um, this afternoon, who's, uh, she is a member of the Green Party um, of Parliament and represents uh, Fredericton, British, uh, sorry, New Brunswick. And this is a mouthful and a lot to say all at once. <laughs> um, uh, MP Atwin uh, was motivated to join politics uh, by her own uh, children's future. Uh, and her educate, uh, she's an education consultant researcher for First Nations education centers and completed a master's in education at the University of New Brunswick. Her top concern, uh, her top concerns are for the environment, mental health and indigenous rights. And then lastly, we are um, gathered with uh, Senator Wanda Tom, is Senator Wanda Thompson Bernard with us today? Has she joined yet? Senator Wanda Thomas Bernard. Yes, yes, I am here. Yeah. Oh, I'm here. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. <laughs> sorry, hey, I, I didn't see you earlier in the room. Um, yeah, so Senator Wanda, uh, Wanda Thomas Bernard uh, is our first African Nova Scotian woman uh, to be appointed at the Senate of, Ca of, Can of Canada, representing the province of Nova Scotia and her hometown of East Preston. Uh, Senator 
Bernard Champion's issues impacting African Canadians uh, and people living with disabilities. She is particularly invested in the um, in human rights, employment, equity, and mental health. Uh, through her involvement with the community projects, uh, her social work career, um, her time with Dalhouse uh, School of Social Work, and her work with the Senate, Senator Bernard uh, has maintained a deep, dedicated social justice and racial uh, racial justice. Senator Bernard advocates for reparations for historical. Uh, for historic and continued anti-Black racism impacting the lives of African Canadians in her work. Okay, so um, for our panel today, um, we will be, um, for those that would like to ask questions, um, we there is a feature in the chat section that allows individuals to raise their hand. So, um, People uh, that like to ask questions uh, that or have asked questions or written questions beforehand to be asked now um, will raise uh, will raise their hand and then they'll be put into a queue um, in which uh, the, um, and this will let the, the the host know like who wants to say something without inter interrupting the actual speaker and then um, after each question is asked i will go through and direct uh, the question to the appropriate um to the appropriate individual if there isn't anybody who's willing to ask questions we do have some uh questions set up beforehand um uh to to ask the our uh, our, our panelists as well um okay so okay so it is i guess it's time to ask our first question uh yeah. we don't like to ask chris it's only Kelsey. that one panelist speak at the time sorry it's kelsey here i'm so sorry to interrupt do you mind if we maybe practice raising our hand because i want to make sure everyone knows how yeah. to do that is that okay yeah 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 this was a process beforehand so it is uh, yeah um if you like to so one thing so how we uh go about practicing raising our hand so on the bottom section beside the chat section there's a participant uh area and in that area you go and you'll see the list of all the participants in the chat so you just click the section right beside mute me that says raise my hand and then you'll be put in uh we'll, we'll put you in the queue to be able to ask your question so Thanks, if you'd Chris. like to now um anybody could go and go to the participants okay yeah so cool so i've seen caitlin has raised her hand and uh we'll go about this process it actually goes in order of individuals that do raise their hand so uh, we won't get lost in track of a, a person um, losing their place in line. And then I think Ooh. once you've raised your hand, make sure to lower it just to make sure you don't stay in the queue. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Um, I guess I just need to. Should I ask the first question? <laughs> no, so the first person who wants to ask away their question, just raise yeah. your hand. And then um, we will we'll allow you to turn on your camera and you could ask away whatever questions you like um, directly to the parliamentarian. Okay. If there's a specific uh, parliamentarian that you want uh, to answer your question, you could uh, say their name directly or um, yeah. So raise your hand if you're ready to ask a question. Hi, everyone. I raised my hand first, but I think the icon already went down. But uh, I have a question just to all of the parliamentarians, if anyone wants to answer it. So I just want to address everything that has been going on in the social and political climate right now. And I'm in grade 12. I'm in my last year. And I can say for a lot of people in my age group, it's really impacted them for some of them. It's really empowered them. They feel like their voice has gotten stronger by seeing all the activism around them. But for a lot of people that I do know, they kind of feel more discouraged and they feel weaker with everything that's going on too. So what would you say to the people my age that are feeling kind of shadowed by everything and as their voice is kind of not as powerful right now? with everything going on.
So Chris, did you maybe want to direct our first question to MP Greg Fergus, and then we can move through parliamentarians uh, from there? My audio device just died. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so um, I guess, uh, yeah, Senator um, Greg Fergus, would you like to, uh, sorry, not Senator, sorry. Did you want it, Senator Juana Bernard to speak first? I, let's give, um, <laughs> and Pete yeah, Fergus, no, I saw I you vigorously well, nod your head. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I'm just like, I mean, because if he you wants to be a Senator one day, it's possible. <laughs> I, I think, first of all, one of the reasons why I'd like Sandra to go first, I mean, happy to go first, but Sandra uh, Wanda Bernard Thomas is a, uh, has been doing this uh, longer uh, than any of us and has uh, just so much wealth of experience uh, from her. I think she'd be ideal to start this off and really to, to frame the debate. So what he's really saying, what my esteemed colleague is really saying is she's the oldest one on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> They're just passing the bill. <laughs> I, I believe I am. I believe I am the oldest one on the panel. And I was saying in the small group that I was in earlier that my first act of activism was when I was 12 years old. Wow. I've been doing this for, well, you can find my age online. So I'll tell you, I've been doing this for 55 years. 55 years. And when I think about that, if I think about that too long, I start to feel weary. But my grandsons reminded me just the other day that they helped to keep me young and certainly young at heart. So I would, in my response, and I was thinking about this when the question was being asked and you called on Greg Fergus, MP Fergus, I, I thought I might go next. But I started to think about the fact that for anyone who's thinking that your voice doesn't matter right now, I would say that it absolutely does. And one of the things that I've been saying, we're, we're, what we're witnessing in this time is the collision of the pandemic of COVID with the pandemic of racism. So we've got these, this collision. People, the, the murder of George Floyd galvanized people around the world and made them more aware of anti-Black racism. But some of us have been aware of it for generations. And, 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 and not just aware, but experiencing it. And so on the one hand, I'm certainly hearing from people that uh, they're a little frustrated. Suddenly, you know, the world is awakened to anti-Black racism. And it's as though, it's as though the last 400 years uh, didn't really matter, it didn't really happen. But, but they have, and we're very aware and very attuned. But one of the things that I witnessed that gave me incredible critical hope was the fact that so many young people were out there protesting. So many young people from around the world, you know, every race you can imagine, every, um, you know, every country, every community, people, multiracial, people said enough is enough and they were out there protesting. I was quite worried for some people because they were protesting without masks. And that made me a little worried because you know personal safety is important, but people were so angry and needed to use their voices. And one of the ways they did that was through protesting. And so those, the fact that people did that around the world meant that people around the world were listening. And we need to keep it going. We need to turn this Black Lives Matter moment into a movement. And young people, you, you folks, you will help us to do that. And we need, everyone needs to be part of that, um, part of that journey. We need you to step in and move forward. Or if you've already been in to continue to work, not to grow weary. If you do grow weary, recycle yourself. That's what I always say. I don't, there's no time to be tired. Just recycle, recycle that energy. But we hear you, we see you and we support you. That's why we've given up a Saturday afternoon to be with you because we love what you are doing. So thank you. Cool. So would anybody else on the panel like to address the question? 
Um, I would like to add something. Um, so, I mean, I just just thank you so much for that, Senator Bernard, as well. And um, it really is about getting out there and being active. And then you'll you'll see that there are other people, you know, to, who are with you, that you're not alone. And you kind of feed off that energy. I find myself that whenever I feel um, feel that weariness, um, that I it's and it's because I haven't been around a lot of people. And and I, I mean, in my role, and certainly it's it's changed uh, throughout COVID. But anytime I get back out there and I, I join a rally, um, as an example, um, you know, yesterday we we gathered for uh, Mi'kmaq rights in, in Fredericton, and just being with people with that that like-minded uh, passion for change and 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 that positive transition that we're looking for. You know, I fed off of that, and it really helped me personally. So things like this are incredible, and I just want to thank again everyone who put this together because here we are you know there are so many people who are joined together in this kind of common common front um, to really confront social justice and ensure that we do better in our community so thank you for this and this is what it's all about is uh, you know you're not alone and so that can help deal with some of the kind of the the darkness that can sometimes creep in just know that you know there are here that support people that support you and appreciate you and are just so proud of what you've been doing so thank you so much great um, so uh, let me just go back to our question. Uh, so our next question comes from uh, Rebecca and it is for MP Fergus. Um, okay, so my question is kind of, um, we kind of know through this that our voices are important, um, but how can we make them count? How can we take action, but make it matter? How can we take action in the right way? so that we're not just like saying that we're taking action and saying that we're helping, but that we actually are. Um, and one thing, I just started high school this year um, and I haven't yet, but I know that there will probably come a time when I run into that or that I witness that. Um, so kind of just along with that, how can you, when you're a witness to that, um, how can you talk to people and try and educate people um, and try and make people aware of this while still making it count. Great question, Rebecca, and, it, and it's similar to, to Caitlin's question. So I think the, the thing I'd say, look, um, you do matter, you do count, your voices do mean things. And I always, I, I don't know why, I like Sandra Wanda, I, I've been involved and in, in act, been an activist since 11 years old. And um, I just always figured that, you know, the future is not written. And what we do today will determine what, you know, the actions are the things that we're going to be able to do in, in, in the future. So just don't be afraid. Don't let anybody tell you that you don't matter or your voice doesn't count or you can't get to there. Um, you can. Uh, you just have to work at it. And you have to work really, really, really hard at it sometimes to, to make it happen. So for those who you know or, or, or for those who might say your voice doesn't count because you just started high school that's sort of called cynicism uh you know you know you, it doesn't matter what you do the system will always win um yeah the system certainly has advantages but you have a voice and you have feet to to march and you have hands to to act and to write and to build uh, and you have voices uh, that can speak. So just do that because cynicism is a luxury that few people can afford. Uh, I, I don't think anyone can afford to tell you the truth. Um, we have to act. Uh, so if you wanna make sure that things happen, well then, I mean, you could, there are sort of certain ways you could do it. You can make a statement and you could get people to to support that statement and you're just sort of demanding sort of a systems change also and that's important you also need some people who are going to say okay and i'm going to jump in and i'm going to act on that system and don't let high school teachers uh tell you that you can't you know organize things you can uh look at the you know the the worldwide movement uh that that had been inspired by one student's uh, decision to to strike from school once one day a week, so things can get done. I encourage you to be part of that and to keep on going. And Sandra Bernard is right. When you get tired, 
make sure that there's somebody behind you who you know has fresh legs, has fresh arms, has fresh voices uh, to to take your spot until you until you you know you 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 know you get the energy to do it again, um, and just keep on going at that. Just truly believe that you can make change because guess what you can and the system only wins is when they convince you and all of us and as individuals that our individual voices uh, don't matter don't believe that for a second uh shadow minister chu what would you like to add Uh, thank you, Christopher. But before I, I uh, actually um, put in my two cents worth, let me just uh, give you you a shout out, Christopher. You you've done great. Uh, it's it's not usual that you have the opportunity to address uh, different uh, politicians, from senators to MPs and all that. But you know we are all uh, citizens of this great country here. So you know treat us, call us, uh, Kenny, Wanda, Jen, you know Jenica or Greg, and I th I think we're all okay. But you've been doing good. Just so you know. Um, I I can only draw up upon my um, uh, experience, but uh, in response to uh, Caitlin and other questions here, I think I think it, it's important to remember that we're we're here for the long haul. Uh, Canada definitely it's not a perfect country, but through our 150 plus years, uh, we've come a long way, and um, and and we have made. Uh, many, many incremental uh, changes to our country and, and correct its path from the, from the wrong direction. And, and it's, a, it's a, I would draw the analogy of, of a marathon. It takes generations and generations and, and people like yourself to, to carry the baton from one generation to another. It's, it's very important uh, in that analogy that the, the athlete is actually making sure that the, his physical condition is actually the prime. So likewise, uh, in our generation, we have to examine ourselves and make sure that we don't um, harbor any uh, discriminatory thoughts about any races, uh, and then also then we persistently send out the same message uh, with strength and with unity. You don't run, um, you don't run a marathon without the preparation. And and I would argue that uh, it, it's similar things. We need to exercise ourselves. We need to have the persistence. Uh, we need to have trainers and mentors like Senator Bernard and and help us to guide us. You know what? What do we do in in this in this uh, situation? Uh, in the uh, in the middle of uh, a movement, it's easy to get involved and uh, get excited. But it's important to understand that when the so-called movement, when the moment of the movement subsided, when it is no longer as glamorous and and it's trendy uh, to to join. This is the moment that we need to keep on pressing and keep on continuing our effort. So uh, I'm I'm just here to to voice uh, my support and also to uh, give kudos to uh, young people like you guys and uh, keep up the good work. Uh, so our next question is for uh, is from Alita, and it's directed to uh, Samir Zuberi. So I just I would like to thank um, everyone here for participating, especially the panel and all all the kids here, all, all the youth here. It's really it's really um, important that we're talking about this, we're listening, we're engaging each other. This is really important. So I would like to thank you. That's my um, introduction. Uh, I actually have a question for the panel in general. Um, so when we talk about, you know, the issues that we're seeing right now, racism, uh, homophobia, and sexism, and all that kind of stuff, we see that, but, and the thing is some of our youth, I'm not saying, I'm not overgeneralizing anything, 
It's just that, um, unfortunately, some youth, they feel this, they have this sense of apathy. They are like desensitized to uh, black issues, especially seeing um, uh, violent stuff going on. So if anyone's on social media, which I know a lot of you guys are, um, you would see sometimes there, there are trigger, triggering images and there's sometimes uh, there's, uh, you know, videos of graphic stuff happening to minorities, especially to black people. But the thing is, those people who do share it, who do spread the voice, they're not um, proactively amplifying the voice of black, the black community, but instead they are sort of uh, just jumping on it as like a trend, as, um, you know, like it's a trend. And it's really sad to see that. And so how do we amplify and pass the mic on to the black community, the black trans and queer community? That's my question. So yeah. So maybe I'll take a first go at this and um, let others uh, contribute too. Um, thanks, Alita, for your question. And when it comes to racism, homophobia, other forms of intolerance and discrimination, it's it's critical, it's important that we speak up, um, that we are, are acting uh, to address this. First off, I mean, I, I see a lot of young people here, so I want to, I, and, and the people who are in school, I want to just say that, um, that it's great that you're here. Um, it's great that you're learning about this, and a lot of these concepts might be a bit complicated uh, for you. Um, I, you know, and but it's really, I think, excellent that you're here right now. I would encourage you, uh, all the young people and e the older people, if you're learning anything, it's important that we share it and talk with people around us about what we're learning, uh, be it our, our family, our, our friends at school, um, our parents, our children. Uh, it's important that we actually share what we're learning in this, in this sitting. Um, I, I would encourage everybody to do that. Somebody asked earlier, how do we actually make change? You know, how do we actually impact change? It's by actually doing exactly that, by talking with somebody in our lives about what we're learning here, we're gonna create change because we are lucky to be part of this Zoom call. Not everybody is here with us. Um, so, so by sharing what we're learning here, we're gonna be creating change. Um, I wanted to touch briefly upon uh, what was mentioned with respect to um, what somebody mentioned about, there's a lot of pressure, Black Lives Matter. There's been a lot of kind of weight on our shoulders. Um, it's important that sometimes we, we step up and get involved, but when we feel a bit tired, it's okay to step back for a bit, not permanently, but for a bit, and then we step back again to, um, front to the, to the, to the, to, to the front. I'll, I'll finish with this last point, um, which touches, circles back, goes back to what Alita mentioned. Um, myself, I'm not Black. I'm a person of color, uh, like you are, Alita, and many others are. Um, we don't experience um, anti-Black racism. We do experience some form of discrimination based upon who we are, the impressions that uh, people have about us. It's important, I, I, you know, I was reading Malcolm X's biography by Alex Haley, and in there um, he said at a certain point in time, he was a, somebody in his context of the 60s, uh, but he said um, something that was powerful that still sticks with me. He said that, that everybody who's not black should stand behind the black person and and follow their lead not in those words but he did say that something that means exactly that and that was a very powerful statement and it stuck with me till today and for myself i i do stand uh with with um greg and with um with um uh, matthew and with uh senator wanda i i i take their lead contribute in the conversation, but do take their lead. So just want to leave you with that point. Uh, uh, MP, for, um, MP Greg Fergus, would you like to follow up? I'd love to, Christopher. And just remember, just Greg and Matthew and Samir. And sorry, Miranda. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm so formal. <laughs> um, Alita, thank you so much for that question. Look, uh, I think you know Samir is being very uh, very modest. He's also been a huge leader on uh, fighting uh, and uh, Islamophobia uh, and, and making sure that there uh, he's been a national leader on this uh, for for a very long period of time. And so I'm you know I'm I'm just lucky to uh, to, to count him as a as a as a friend and colleague. 
and uh, to have his support. Look, you're, I'm so glad you mentioned other fights as well. Um, whether it's sexual orientation, you know, uh, identity, uh, 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 gender relations, um, uh, abilities, it's, it's all the same. It, it really is all the same. When I was a kid growing up uh, in, in suburban Montreal, I grew up in a Jewish neighborhood uh, that was mostly Anglophone, and I was one of the few uh, Black people uh, in that whole, you know, town in the West Island of Montreal. Uh, and we lived in a French city, in a French province, in a, you know, mostly English North America. So, you know, minority within the minority within the minority, um, you just see things differently. And to me, that's a source of strength. Um, because you could see the things that the majority can see, but you could also step back and see things differently. I'm certain as a young woman, you probably see things differently uh, than young men in, uh, in, uh, amongst your peers. And so you know, that, that is an important aspect uh, that you need to keep it. And, and don't see it as being a, a weakness, it's a strength. And the fights that you fight to ensure your place is my fight. And if we all extend to each other that same kindness that we see another person's fight as our own, and as Samir uh, in quoting uh, Malcolm X, and we stand behind that person to lend them support, that's really powerful. It says two things, A, that you matter, that you're worthy, and secondly, is that you know that you are not alone. And that, just goes that that's good for anybody's soul. Yeah. Um, would anybody else on the panel like to address this um, question? We are really running I, short on time. Yeah, I'm happy to jump in there real quick because as as uh, as much love as I have from my brother, I'm going to take a minute and express and demonstrate how we can respectfully disagree on some issues and still love one another because I don't believe that all marginalization is the same, that I don't believe that people experience the same way. And the reason is, is because anti-black racism, much like anti-indigenous racism are two very particular experiences in the context of Canada based on the experience of white supremacy. So white supremacy can happen in communities that are disabled communities, that are LGBTQ communities, that are uh, uh, gendered uh, communities with, with, with women or, or non-binary folks. Uh, and so, you know, in a scenario where we are in a society that puts the primacy of whiteness, and I'm not saying that if you're white and you're young and you're hearing me say that, that's not a derogatory term. Just like I say, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a, a black person. Uh, it is true that you are also white and that's not a bad thing. So I'm not saying that so that you feel bad, but just know that in society, there are things that you will never have to consider that a black person or an indigenous person would have to consider. Uh, and it's also true for people who happen to be black and Muslim or black and disabled or black and female or all four of those things. And so what I want to do, and I hope you guys get a chance to take this away, is that anti-black racism exists in a much different and deeper context in Canada in the same way anti-indigenous uh, racism exists here as a colonial country. Can I just add something quickly about um, the social media context that Alita uh, alluded to? And there's also agency in in how you use those platforms um, and protect yourselves from some of the 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 negativity and just just overt um, you know hatred that you can sometimes come across. Um, and you know what I often do is if I see something I don't like, I am not afraid to report to ensure that those accounts, you know, are, are held accountable. And I've gotten people removed off of Twitter or off of Facebook for some of the things that they're saying. Um, so there is agency uh, that you can employ when you're, when you're using those platforms. Um, so be sure to protect yourself because, um, you know, sometimes it can feel that you can't escape it. And that can be, uh, you know, a really heavy 
feeling to carry around. Um, but just know that you can you can block, you can delete, and you can ensure that those people can't, uh, you know, that their words can't continue to hurt you. Um, so, I, and I do hear what you're saying. There are people sometimes that just share things to share them, and they're not adding to the important conversation and the actions and intent that we need to see behind them. Um, and so don't be afraid to call those people out. <laughs> we need to name it, and we need to, you know, to acknowledge what they're doing and, and make sure that they're held accountable for that. So that, that was a really important question, Alita. Thank you so much. Can I, can I just add to that? Oh. Jenica raised, no, I'm sorry, just because she raised such a good point. And it's just that don't believe that every person you see on cyberspace is real. I'm the second oldest. I mean, Senator Bernard might be the most experienced. I'm the second most uh, on this panel. And so I'm not native to, uh, to you know, this digital world. And so I never made that connection in my head that any person I see on Twitter is an actual real person. Okay. The real people you meet are the people who you invite out to come out to show up at a rally together. So those are the people you focus on. Just keep that in mind. And you don't have to read everything you, that's posted on social media. You could, you could turn it off too. Can, okay. I can I jump in with just one comment, please? Yeah, I, and we'd also like to hear from Kenny if possible. We, uh, we are really, we have no other time though. <laughs> Just very quickly, I'll just yeah. say, in the, in the workshop that I did, I talked, I, I shared some um, uh, some ideas around being an ally, and one of the and also talked about intersectionality, and which I think Matthew was just highlighting. But I wanted to, uh, what I wanted to share here was the importance of people being willing to have the difficult conversations, and I, that came up in our small group as well. So have the conversations, and I don't think we have those conversations well if we're trying to do it uh, online through Facebook, Twitter, other social media. So, so we have to be willing to have those conversations. So you know, a telephone call, enter the dialogue. Don't be afraid to do that. Thank you. Uh, I feel like the event is uh, starting to run on Black Standard Time. Um, <laughs> out of time um but i uh, i would like to uh, get a, a one last comment from kenny and then i would like to address uh the, the opportunity to speak to the uh, kids help online afterwards well thank you chris um it, it's definitely not running on chinese standard time because you started on time <laughs> 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 now uh, i i think i think the uh just one last very brief final point is we have uh we have to find uh, our own battleground to fight. Um, Canada, it's a very diverse country. Um, in the Pacific coast, for example, uh, what we were facing was a significant uh, discriminations and racism towards uh, Oriental communities that was here before too. And, you know, the Chinese Exclusion Act, for example, prevented anybody of color of the Oriental Chinese uh, countries, you know, coming to Canada, separating families, and it was it was actually uh, with a a small involvement of mine, we were able to uh, unite the community together, uh, and then and then demanded the government to repeal that and to redress that. Um, we have to find uh, our, our own battleground, and we need to stand behind, just like uh, uh, MP Fergus uh, Greg was saying, we need to stand behind other uh, fighting that battle in in the pacific coast um, black life matters may not be as prominent but we can definitely add the voice behind them and also against any uh, movements that are against any other racist uh, and racism incidents here so i encourage everybody to find um, their their battleground their field and be persistent and run the long marathon that we have to fight Okay, thank you so much. Um, actually, uh, Matthew Green did something uh, that I would actually like ask everyone in the in the chat to actually do. Um, because we were running so short on time, if anyone would like to speak or follow up with any of the um, uh, MPs, uh, Minister of Parliament or the Senator, um, feel free to uh, put your information, email, social media at uh, in the chat. And I'd like to pass it on to, off to Shanice to introduce uh, tomorrow. Thank you so much, Christopher. You did such a wonderful job. And thank you so much to every single one of our panelists. You have done so much to pave a way for us. And I'm very grateful to be able to have you guys uh, 
be on today's panel. Hopefully the youth have been able to take away something really important from this conversation. And um, yeah, this is our future. Uh, with that, these are our, the kids of the future and uh, you're really definitely doing a lot to help us get to where we need to be. So essentially we're gonna be taking about a five uh, to 10 minute break right now and come back around 3.55 PM for a presentation from the Kids Health Room from, uh, I believe the name is uh, Tamar. So yes, uh, please come back around uh, 3.55, but right now we are on break. Thank you so much and I'll see you guys soon. Thank you Take so care. much for having us. Really appreciate yeah. it. Say hey, bye, Benny. Bye, Hi everybody, thank you so much for coming back and coming to the final portions of our event. This is gonna be really exciting. Before we go off into uh, my closing speech and then into our performance, um, our special performance, I want to introduce you to Tamar who wants to uh, kind of talk to you guys about um, the kids' help phone and a lot of the data that they've collected around Blacks. So. I will so, now pass it on to Tamar, so go right ahead. Thank you so much. So as Shanice mentioned, um, my name is Tamar Brannigan. I am absolutely honored to be here. Uh, this has been very inspiring just to see even the last, uh, you know, 10, 15 minutes or so. Um, and I'm one of Kids Health Phone's managers of community crisis responders for their crisis texting service. Um, so really, I'd just like to start by sharing a couple of statistics to illustrate um, the tolls that these decades of injustice has had on Black people and their mental health. Um, so the Mental Health Commission of Canada shared that African and Caribbean Canadians are more exposed to factors that lead to poor mental health, um, insufficient housing, greater unemployment and poverty, lower education and higher levels of criminalization. And Dr. Kwame McKenzie at the Wellesley Institute shared that racism increases the rates of psychosis and depression um, by 200 to 300%. So that's, that's massive. And then finally, uh, the city of Toronto shared that social stresses, including systemic discrimination and microaggressions, actually put Black people at an increased risk of anxiety, depression, uh, suicide, and suicidal thoughts. Um, so what does this mean for our Black youth? So Kids Help Phone is the only 24-7 national e-mental health solution for young people. Um, and we know firsthand the impact uh, that anti-Black racism has on youth. Um, so over the past few months, we've been seeing young people who text our, text our service um, discussing racism to be some of the most stressed of all of our service users. Um, and really, this is second only to those who are fearing harm from somebody in their home. So uh, the people who text in uh, facing abuse. And these same young people um, who are facing racism are more likely to dis discuss suicide than really anyone else. Um, so we've heard from one of our texters on their experiences, and uh, so I wanted to share what uh, one of our texters has said. So the quote that they left us with is, I obviously can't speak for everyone, but there is an overwhelming sense of doom and hopelessness with the pandemic, human rights violations, uh, Black Lives Matter and protests, the continual abuse of Indigenous people, the continuing disrespect of racial minority groups, variety of genders, variety of sexual orientations, et cetera, right now. So Black young people across Canada are struggling. And unfortunately, there's a tremendous data gap with too little known about the experiences and challenges of Black youth um, and what they're facing. So we look at our evaluations. We know that Black young people who reach out to Kids Help Phone report decreases in distress and increases in their confidence and their hope. 66% um, uh, reported that, sharing some, that they have shared something with us that they have never shared before. And 58% reported that if they had not reached out to Kids Help Phone, they would have done nothing. But too often the stigma of reaching out for help is still uh, quite prevalent in Black communities. Uh, we really need to work together to better end the stigma of reaching out for support within these communities. And Kids Health Phone has always been a service for young people. Without judgment, we're here 24-7, 365 um, by phone, uh, by text and online. So that's uh, kidshelpphone.ca. Uh, you can get to our website. You can text uh, 686868. That's our short code 
code for our crisis text line and also call in at 1-800-668-6868. And we're committed to developing new supports for and with Black youth to ensure that every Black young person has a safe place to turn when they're in distress. So we remain a strong ally for Black Youth of Canada, but it really does take leaders and community members like all of you um, to spread awareness of the services that are available. So feel free to share that number with either your kids, your nie nephews, your nieces, um, your friends, your community centers. It really does take a ton of courage to reach out, um, but having a, com a community uh, really does bring, bring and build resilience and access. Um, so this is just a short uh, presentation, but I do want to end uh, by sharing another quote from one of our uh, texting service users. Um, so for years I've battled in silence with my mental health due to past experiences trying to reach out, and tonight I was scared to reach out, but I knew it was best for my own well-being. You were very supportive and made this experience even better than I imagined it could have been. There's such a large stigma, but you made me feel like you did care and reminded me of how strong I truly am. Thank you for your help tonight and for being an amazing helper. So that's some of the feedback that we get. Um, please know that uh, Kids Help Phone is here for you 24 seven, even at 2 a.m. in the morning. Um, and there's really no issue that's too big or also too small for to talk to us about. So really thank you from the bottom of my heart for having me here. Uh, that's, that's kind of my quick presentation for you. Thank you so much, Tamar. Uh, I really appreciate it. I apologize for mispronouncing your name earlier. Oh, so no problem. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say Kids Help Phone really does save so many lives. And um, it's really great. We're really grateful for that. Um, so yeah, thank you. And um, now we're going to be going into the closing uh, performances. But before that, as we come to the end of this event, I want to leave you guys with a few messages before I hand it off to Joshua Watkins for his closing spoken word performance. So this event has been put together to remind you of who you are. Too many times the world has forced us to question our identity. Somewhere down the line, assumptions made about us, how we look, and our culture has forced us to lose our individuality. Our culture is our community, our family, and within that lives our individuality, the things that make us unique. And this event has been put together to teach you about your history, your identity, not only that, but also your capabilities, and to empower you to be confident in your Blackness. I know 2020 has been a difficult year for all of us, and the amount of change that has been happening has been overwhelming uncomfortable and scary. But it's the only way we get to see something new and beautiful. I, for one, am not a stranger to drastic changes and sometimes a little bit of chaos. I was a kid from the foster care system and I went through a lot. And I was constantly asked, how did you find the strength? I've asked that question to myself plenty of times and I've reminisced around the answer for a very long time. And looking back at the things in which I've experienced, the amount of adversities I've had to overcome, I couldn't tell you how I found the mental strength to continue to fight. But then I started to also ask myself, why am I constantly experiencing all of this trauma and hardship? What did I do wrong? What, is this something that I deserve? And essentially, I wanted more for myself. I was desperate for the sense of belonging and security and acceptance and identity, but I was constantly being pushed over the edge. I would slip off and then manage to somehow catch myself and pull myself back up. But then someone else will come along and push me again. And then I'll catch myself and pull myself up. Then a new person will come along and it'll be a repeated cycle. And eventually my arms will get tired and I would start to question or figure, what is the point of pulling myself up when I know that someone new is going to come and push me again? What's the point? I need to just give up. But in that moment, I will fight and find the strength to yet again 
pull myself up. Why? Why is this cycle my life? In my darkest moments, that will be the number one question in my head. I remember asking this question to one of the staffs in my group home. And he told me to go looking for the answer. And I'm like, how? <laughs> and he said, go to the source of the number one trauma in your life and just listen, just listen and observe. And so for me, the number one trauma in my life was my family, specifically my mother. And when I listened and I observed, I learned the following, the struggles, the hardship, the adversity, the trauma in which my mother experienced during her childhood was almost an exact replicate to mine. Not only that, but it was the same as my grandparents. And it was even probably the same as my great grandparents. And that is when I learned about intergenerational trauma. When I made that discovery, a cloud legitimately lifted off my shoulders. I discovered that my situation was not my fault, that there was nothing wrong with me, and that I was a product of the circumstances that was built into my family stemming from slavery. And because it has never been recognized, it had, it had also never been addressed. And now I had my answer as to why. I, my hardship no longer held the same weight over me or controlled me. I now had a reason to keep fighting. And my reason was because my circumstances doesn't define me and it doesn't define my life. I get to define my life. I now knew why I was able to survive because everybody before me did. They fought for me to be here. The reason why I and every one of us are so incredibly strong and resilient is because it was built into our DNA. This event is here to remind you that you were built and bred from kings and queens that at one point ruled nations, that your bloodline comes from powerful and brave leaders that at one point fought for equality. Our culture is still here because we're too resilient to leave. So, I want to remind you that this event is here to empower you, to take back control and to teach you how. So how do you take control? How do you tap into that strength? Well, what does it mean to be strong? It means being okay with being uncomfortable. It means finding that courage and and bravery to speak up for yourself and to do what you know in your heart is right. It means being able to be your own best advocate and to be able to stand your ground because what we need to do is to sustain power and confidence in a society that tries to restrict us. We need to speak up to authority and we need to speak with conviction because they don't get to define our limitations. The way we succeed is by fighting for what's right and what's good and for new opportunities and for to create new opportunities for the generations that come after us. This is why, this is what my life has been preparing me for. To become the next leader, to understand and absorb the pain that lives within my community and turn that into a path by bringing new perspectives to the table. So today, yesterday, before, years ago, Ago, I was just a kid in the foster care system. Today, I am a provincial and hopefully eventually a national leader that is really trying to pave new ways for my people. Today, I am a board member. Today, I am trying to start my own company. And that was because of determination. So today, this event was for you. And I hope you could walk away with learning something new. And that is all for me. Now, let me introduce you guys to Joshua Scribe Walkis. A lifetime immense in performing arts has made Joshua Scribe Walkis entirely devoted 
to the de devoted to the gift of storytelling. Through spoken word poetry and hip hop, he has taken thousands into the world to ex into his world to experience it as he does. The Scarborough-born poet has performed on stages across Canada, appeared on CBC, and has opened up has has opened for legendary hip hop bands, The Roots, with the Uncharted with the Uncharted Collectives, and then as a competitor, he has attended the Fest Canadian Festivals of Spoken Word in 2014, 2015, and 2017, and he has never missed a final stage, winning the championships in 2019. Scribe owner and facilitator of Word is Bond is an artist, educator, and champion in 2019. Oh, sorry, and champ, sorry, and event organizer. My apologies. As well as a member of the Up From the Roots Collective. His goal is not only to bring his audience through his story, but to gift them with the courage to do so, what he calls the brave act on earth. So to share their stories in their words and out loud. And without any further ado, please welcome Joshua Scribe Watkins. Hey, what's up friends? How are we doing? Um, I ask that almost rhetorically because all of you are on mute and all of us answering at the same time would completely disrupt this whole thing. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. It's my, my pleasure to be able to share stories with you today. It's my pleasure to, to speak to a, a generation coming up that really has the ability to impact and shift and change the world that we exist in. Uh, there's so much going on in the world right now that generations before you and before me haven't really ever experienced all at once. We've never experienced a civil rights movement within a pandemic, within multiple political climate shifts happening all at once. And I just want to, before I say anything else, acknowledge the privilege it is to be able to share what I've learned um, and how I've interpreted my life as lessons for other people. I don't think of myself as being much wiser than the next person. I don't think of myself as being too much smarter than the next person. Uh, but what I do know is that I've been given the gift to, to share and to teach. And so I hope what I have to say today will be impactful for you. Uh, I hope you like the art. And at the, the very, very least, I hope you, you take something from today. I hope at the, the next opportunity for you, you get to explore what it means to tell your own story. You get to explore what it means for you to say your piece in your words out loud. And at the end of the day, the most important thing is that you know that, uh, especially for all of the Black youth in here, that no one can take your story from you once you say it. Your story is your power. And even if you feel like everything you've said and everything you've experienced up until this point has been for nothing, I promise you that it's not. I promise you that your story means something to somebody somewhere and that you're alive to tell it is the most important thing. Uh, so it's funny, we were talking about generational curses and intergenerational trauma, and that's what my first poem is about. So I'm just gonna get right to it. To break generational curses, one must reverse the original incantations inverse and uproot them from the earth by speaking new cycles into truth. We don't like to talk about the underbelly of black magic, the rot in the wood of our family trees, the way even if you excel in manifesting your dreams, chains run deeper than being enslaved or free in my family. The men who bear my last name bear the curses of funhouse mirrors, flames, and turntable DNA for me, for the men in my family, Generational curses activate the moment we attempt to develop our own realities for me, for the men in my family. Abandonment escapes the womb by clutching the ankle of its twin. We cannot desert what we did not first attempt loving, mating, or making kin. Me and the men in my family laugh as we burn down fun houses in our sleep, then wake up to ash and scatter glass, wondering why we can't find any peace. How it happened doesn't matter. It only matters that it did. My parents' divorce made it apparent to me that I couldn't let this happen when I had kids, and now my first is on its way. As I'm writing this, their gender and sex only God and the ultrasound technicians can say, and if I'm being completely honest, 
I'm terrified of raising a son. Not because of gang bangers or cops with guns, but because it means I have to be the one who undoes all the curses, healing generations of damage already done. I have never met my father's father. All their encounters can be counted on one hand. So when I say my father's absence is understandable, I mean my dad is better than his at being present, but his style of black magic still presents itself like a vanishing act. He never disappears from me though. When my life is full, when I finally find space to laugh, his voice bursts through my joy. When I stare in mirrors, they funhouse my mother's features, pull up every trace of his DNA, and when they rest on my face, all I want to do is burn his resemblance away. I imagine this cycle has been on replay for as long as we have been unable to turn the tables, unwilling to do the painful work to catch the match and scratch the wax before the fire track that sends curses coursing through our homes starts to play, I heard once that men always try to imitate or destroy their fathers. In my life, those things are one in the same. So today I break the mold. Today I reverse the curse and create a new kind of family man. Today inside me, a shrieking double helix quiets, cools. The fun house folds into one unburnt reflection. My gaze meets itself ceases seeking to punish my forefathers by sabotaging my own life. My glass image gains gentle palms and permission to leave the arson of homes to deadbeats past. At last, I am adored and feel no call to cremation. At last, I can live a full life without the fear that I will burn it all down. Thank you. All righty, we're gonna keep it moving. Um, the next poem is about uh, as bluntly as I can put this, uh, anti-Black racism uh, and its origin. Uh, the idea a lot of the time that Black people have put in their minds is that we have to fight against injustice because we are the ones experiencing the oppression. Uh, and I don't necessarily come from that school of thought. We should survive and we should fight for our rights. Yes, absolutely, we should stand up for ourselves. But the problem didn't start with us. Um, and the problem does not end with us. The problem uh, of racism and not just racism on a level of prejudice, because prejudice is different than systemic racism. Prejudice is about people not liking other people based on differences uh, and prejudgments. And that's always gonna happen across people groups and we can work on that. Uh, but racism goes a step deeper into systems and, and governing bodies and the way things have been established over the course of history. And so uh, I'm gonna read you this poem called The Issue. And I want you to, to think about it, especially again, for the black people in, in this space. I don't want you to take on this burden thinking it's yours alone to solve when it's, it was not your problem. You didn't make it happen. You didn't do anything for people not to like you based on the color of your skin. So this poem is called The Issue. And the issue isn't that white people took slave it's that their eyes don't work. The issue is that white people after millennia spent in the dark forsook it, projected onto it every nightmare they possessed and that in their misunderstanding of radiance of all in this world that is pure, they took fair to mean clean instead of hidden from the sun. It is uncanny the way each ugly thing white folks see in our skin is generations of their own depravity unhinged. They are convinced because we are dark, we must be guilty of whatever their imaginations conjure. They are convinced something is wrong and they are correct. They are convinced they are the solution. And for centuries, we have paid the price for that delusion. Can you imagine your every fear, your whole capacity for depravity on display? Can you imagine watching eyes contort skin like funhouse mirrors because we watch them bend us out of shape, light hitting their eyes the wrong way. And one day it just clicks. Friend, they aren't even looking at you. That their problem isn't you. It's that light makes obvious what is being done in the dark. White skin is the only kind that flinches when you mention how it's glaring in the sun. Like it's scared to say where it's been hiding. And that's that poem, The Issue. Um, and again, that's not about a certain race of people. It's about ideas. Uh, and the idea that the more guilt you experience about something like slavery and something like institutionalizing racism, the more guilt you feel and the more you project that onto other people. Um, James Baldwin 
said something brilliant. I'm not uh, the slur that you call me, you are. Um, we don't say things about people that we don't believe about ourselves. We don't say ugly things about people unless we find it somewhere hidden in ourselves to say so. And so remember that sometimes when people are pointing prejudice at you, it's not about you, it's about them. Uh, hold on to that, no matter who you are, no matter where you come from, that's an important lesson that I learned. Uh, this next poem is for, uh, for you. Baby, no matter what your mama told you, even if you the most beautiful sight to grace God's green earth since the virgin birth, you are not, in fact, a miracle. A miracle is an occurrence that forces science to shrug its shoulders and point aimlessly at the heavens for an explanation that will not come. Baby, I heard one too many reports regarding the flesh and bones of us black folk how we achieve the impossible through some mystical force etched into melanin, every feat achieved attributed to black magic. And while it sounds fantastic, I find myself full of resentment. A longing for a basic self-esteem amongst our people has turned inherently tragic to my family. The skin folk who are kin folk, remember you arrived on earth much like I did, quite the opposite of miraculous, soaking, scared, and most likely to no one's surprise. No matter how the inhabitants of this cruel place have tried to make you feel you are indeed human. Our bodies need be nothing but bodies, loved one. Our curls don't defy gravity. Every lock grows thick and tight enough to spiral up from our scalps. Our hair is no crown, but the oil we use grants it an iridescent gleam. Our skin may be cocoa to caramel colored, a breathtaking onyx or fertile soil, but we only tasty to animals and cannibals and only became one with earth after leaving our hearse for centuries, we have been made to feel less than. And someone somewhere along the line thought it necessary to take on divine definition to strengthen our spines, but a miracle is an occurrence that forces science to shrug its shoulders and point aimlessly at the heavens for an explanation that will not come. So if I must speak about black magic, May I only offer praises and phrases that honor every way our people practice spiritual alchemy. Black magic is the sound of our voices turning hymns of a colonizer's God into songs of liberation. It is the ability to summon dignity from the scum of an officer's boot and grow abundance from ghetto roots. It is bravery in the face of every devil with intent to distract and disrupt, disfigure and dismantle, knowing our bodies can be destroyed, but our souls cannot be swallowed by the void if I must speak on black magic. It will not be that we are still here, still standing. No, it will be that we are still here with the whole world spellbound at the fact that we can still sing. Thank you, thank you. This last joint is a letter I wrote uh, to my unborn child years ago. Uh, she is now in the world. She's gonna be one in a couple weeks. And I wrote this poem because uh, I knew my, my great grandmother, uh, she was getting on in years. And this was, I took a picture with her and realized like she's old and not just like casually old, like she was 99. Um, and she died just before uh, my wife got pregnant. And so uh, this poem I wrote before, before she came into the world and I hope it translates to you something about uh, our, our position in the world, especially as black people. We aren't born, we aren't born with some sort of pain prefixed into our spirits. Do you know what I'm saying? We're not born hurting. And it's so important for you to know that because there is something precious inside of you. Uh, and I hope that you uh, hear it in this poem. My dear little one, at this moment, you are more fantasy than idea, more half-remembered vapor dream than concrete thought, but you will be someday, someday. You will go from concrete thought to concrete evidence, a solid line on a plastic stick announcing your potential arrival. And when that day comes, I am unsure if I will be able to write poetry for you while I tend to the magnificence of your mother's magic. So I am writing for you now. There's so much I want to teach you. So many lessons I want to whisper into your womb world and have scrawled in cursive print for your formative years, but until then, I will write here. Share my faith and share my fears like I've shared my DNA and last name today. Let me teach you about your smile. 
Your smile will be my favorite thing about you until I can make conversation. Even maybe sometime after, my child, your smile is time paradox. Antique family heirloom sealed in skeleton. It is evidence that a human spirit wrapped rich in melanin does not come prepackaged with paint. Proof that black happiness predates our chains. I took a picture with your great great grandmother the other day. If she's alive to see you arrive, she will have watched a century crumble into dust. She is 99 now. Time and gravity are her closest friends. Racism and sexism, her lifelong next door neighbors. I imagine death visits to use her phone book as a hit list. Each strike through the names a reminder of how close she is to being a load on this side and still. Her grin is so wide, I wonder if there are hot air helium balloons tied to the ends of her lips. If her joy has learned to Charleston through chaos, twist to her troubles, as if the melting pot of misery that should be her existence just can't burst her bubble, my child. When your mouth splits into two rows of crystal-coated sunshine, know it is the inheritance of treasured life that makes your laughter so buoyant. Forged from the knowledge that life is too short to wear fear as a face mask, too precious to wear cold expressions to survive, keep it ready, stored and close. And always remember that our joy does not know how to die. Thank you all so much for your time. I appreciate you and your energy. May you be blessed today. Uh, and I really hope uh, for your sakes that as you go on through the rest of the day, that you feel inspired, that you feel touched, that you feel energized, uh, and that you get to carry uh, your spirit, your energy forward into this world. I appreciate you. I appreciate your attentiveness. And I appreciate some of the smiles I'm seeing on these screens. Uh, they do mean the world and they are powerful and they are important. Uh, keep it close to you. All right. Much love. Be well. Thank you. I just want to give like a clap. This is a silent clap. But like, I would go on, stand, stand on my feet to give you a standing ovation. That was amazing. Amazing. I got to take a walk through your lens, through your perception of life. And it was, just, it was awakening. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. That got me emotional. Oh. Yeah, so thank you everybody for coming today. I'm so incredibly grateful that we got to end it off on that powerful note. That was unbelievable. Um, so yes, we do have our next YCP event happening on November 28th. For anybody else who um, wants to still continue to sign up, but that is the end for today. Today, I hope you really did learn something powerful. I hope you were moved and I hope you were empowered and inspired and you're able to walk away feeling like you're able to take on the world because you can. I need you to know that you can. And so, yes, have a wonderful rest of your day. If you wanna stay around and chat uh, for the next few minutes, you absolutely can. Um, and think once again, thank you. All right. And thank you to all the sponsors as well. Thank you. That, that will include, uh, you know, IG Wells, Rising Youth, um, Canadian Red Cross, Government of Canada, TELUS. Thank you all for being able to make this happen. This has been absolutely fantastic. All right. I'll see you guys all next week. All right. Take care.